Hello and welcome to Vantage This Week, a show where we recap the highlights of the week gone by. This week we saw escalating tensions in South Asia. Pakistan and the Taliban have been trading blows. The two terror hotspots are training their guns on each other and the world is urging calm. We bring you the details. Meanwhile, India is on the other end of the spectrum, bringing peace and calm to troubled seas. The Indian Navy pulled off a heroic rescue saving 17 people from Somali pirates. There was good news from the other side of Asia as well. Japan has broken out of its rut. After decades, the Asian tiger finally saw inflation. We explain why this is a good thing for Japan. But along with the good news, there is the bad this week. The whole world should be wary. A new report is out. It says only seven countries have clean air. We have all this and more on Vantage this week. Let's get started. Breakups can be ugly. There can be a lot of shouting, a lot of emotions, maybe even some salty messages. But this breakup has taken it to the next level. It involves fighter jets, airstrikes and terrorism. I'm talking about Pakistan and the Taliban. They're both clashing again. The Taliban says Pakistan bombed two Afghan areas. The first was Barmal in the Paktika province. The second was Sepera in Khost. Now, both provinces border Pakistan. The Taliban says Pakistani planes flew in at around 3 a.m. local time, dropped bombs in two places, then flew back. And casualties? Around eight people have been killed. The Taliban claim that they were women and children. And what is Pakistan saying? Well, they have admitted to carrying out airstrikes, but not in Afghanistan. Islamabad says this operation was inside Pakistan. They claim eight terrorists were killed. Now, the motive is pretty clear. Pakistan suffered a terror attack over the weekend. A military post in Waziristan was attacked. Around seven soldiers were killed and two of them were officers. Now, this attack was later claimed by a new terror group. It's called jaish e fursan e mohammad Pakistan says this group is based in Afghanistan and the Taliban shields them. So, response was always on the cards. A funeral for the slain Pakistani soldiers was held on Saturday. President Asif Ali Zardari and Army Chief Asim Munir attended it. Both men appeared quite involved. Take a look at this. मैं आपसे यह वादा करता हूं कि यह मेरे बेटों का खून रागा नहीं जाएगा और हम इस खून का हिराज लेंगे इनसे सबसे हिराज लेंगे पाकिस्तान ने यह तय कर लिया है कि जो भी हमारे सरदों पे या हमारे घर में आके या हमारे मुल्क में आके जो भी टेररिज्म करेगा हम उसका मुंह तोड़ जवाब देंगे so there was a warning. Pakistan's president hinted at a military response and 24 hours later it came. But how is the Taliban reacting to it? Their statement makes for an interesting read. Let me quote from what the Taliban has said. We have a long experience of freedom struggles against superpowers. We do not allow anyone to invade our country. This is the Taliban saying. Pakistan should not blame Afghanistan for the lack of control incompetence and problems in its own territory. How about that? The Taliban says Pakistan is incompetent and it's not just words. They are hitting back militarily too. There were reports of a gunfight near the border. Apparently, the Taliban fired at Pakistani military targets. So it's a cycle of tit-for-tat attacks. But how did things descend to this level and what happens next? Let's go all the way back to 2021. Pakistan supported the Taliban's conquest of Kabul. They urged the global community to work with the Taliban to give them aid. But soon the equation changed. Pakistan needed the Taliban's help to contain the TTP. That's the Harike Taliban Pakistan, basically the Pakistani Taliban. Their goal is to establish an Islamic caliphate in the country. How? By toppling the current regime. But these Taliban have ethnic ties. Most of their rank and file are Pashtuns. So Pakistan hoped the Taliban would use their influence, maybe reign in the TTP, but the opposite has happened. A United Nations report has detailed this nexus. It says the Taliban is arming and funding the TTP. 
They're setting up training camps, giving them aid packages, and also shielding them from Pakistan. And the data supports this. Some 650 attacks were reported last year. They killed almost 1,000 Pakistanis. Around 93% of these attacks were in two provinces, Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And what's special about them? Both provinces border Afghanistan. So you can join the dots here. The Taliban is giving a safe haven to the TTP. And what has Pakistan done about it? In 2022, they launched similar airstrikes. Around 47 Afghans were killed in the bombing. Then Afghan refugees were deported. There are 4 million of them in Pakistan. Around 1.7 million were ordered to leave. Again, the idea was to build pressure on Kabul, but no luck. Finally, Pakistan complained to, to the United Nations. They asked the United Nations Thank Security you. Council President. to act against the Taliban. Again, no luck. Because the international community has moved on. They may criticize and condemn, but they're not coming to save Pakistan, which raises the question, what next? Well, this Pakistani regime looks weak. The civilian government is deeply unpopular and the army's foothold has eroded. In January, the Iranians flew into Pakistani airspace. They bombed a border town in the West. So the regime had to send a message, a strong and symbolic message that Pakistan is capable of defending itself. Hence this airstrike on Afghanistan. At the same time, they may not want an escalation. Why else would they deny striking inside Afghanistan? So the next move is the Taliban's. They have a lot of options to choose from. The easiest would be another proxy attack to unleash the TTP again. But either way, it's a lesson for Pakistan's generals. They back the Afghan Taliban as good terrorists. They fought the Pakistani Taliban as bad terrorists. And now look at them. Both good and bad have joined hands. And together, they're bleeding Pakistan. I'm afraid Islamabad is alone in this battle, not because the world doesn't care about terrorism. We do. But because Pakistan is responsible for this mess. Their deep state funded and armed terror groups. There's no point complaining now. Our next story is from the Indian Ocean. The Indian Navy has proved itself yet again here. They conducted a daring anti-piracy operation, an operation that lasted 40 hours. The target was a ship captured by Somali pirates. A Maltese flagged bulk cargo vessel called the MV Ruin. The ship was captured by Somali pirates back in December. For months, they were holding the crew hostage until Saturday. That's when the Indian Navy sprung into action. They rescued the crew and captured 35 pirates. The pirates are now being brought to India, where justice will be dispensed. Here's our report. The Indian Navy has pulled off a daring rescue. It has reiterated its position as guardian of the Indian Ocean. This weekend, the Navy saved the lives of 17 people. 17 people who had been captured by a horde of Somali pirates. It was a daring rescue. It took 40 hours and a little help from the Indian Air Force. Here's how it went down. On December 14th, Somali pirates had captured this ship, the MV Ruin. It's a bulk cargo carrier. It was carrying steel. It was sailing near the Yemeni island of Socotra. That's where the pirates struck. They captured the ship and held its crew hostage. It was the first time Somali pirates captured a ship since 2017. The pirates turned the MV Ruen into a mothership, effectively a base of operations to launch further attacks from. All this happened in mid-December. The crew was held hostage for over three months, and the world struggled to do much because they were being used as human shields. But the Indian Navy was watching. It has been monitoring the Ruen all this time waiting for the perfect opportunity, and that opportunity arose over the weekend. On Friday, the Ruen was intercepted by the INS Kolkata Guided Missile Destroyer. Backing up the INS Kolkata was a patrol vessel, the INS Subhadra. The rescue squadron also comprised of P-8I long-range maritime patrol aircraft and maritime spotter drones. This squadron intercepted the Ruen the Indian Navy issued a warning, telling the pirates to surrender and release the hostages. But the pirates responded by firing at the Indian Navy. 
they even shot at one of the Navy's drones, which had approached the ship to conduct reconnaissance. And that was their biggest mistake. The Indian Navy could now act in self-defense. The 40-hour mission had begun. The Indian ships cornered the Rouen. Warning shots were fired. The Indian Navy kept telling the pirates to surrender, but a second prong of the operation was also underway. An Indian Air Force C-17 Globemaster transport craft was being readied. Indian Marine Commandos, or Marcos, boarded the plane. After a 10-hour flight, the forces were above the pirate ship. And then they executed a precision airdrop. The commandos were dropped near the pirate vessel, as were two raiding boats. This allowed the Indian Navy to close in on the pirates and eventually board the ship. The 35 Somali pirates were captured, the 17 crew members were rescued and the Indian Navy pulled off a heroic feat. Uh, we are uh, investigating all uh, suspicious vessels which have a piracy trigger uh, and this uh, ongoing operation. So while doing this, we came across this MV Ruin, which was being used as a uh, pirate mothership. So the pirates have surrendered. There were a crew of 17 personnel on board, uh, seven from Bulgaria, one from Angola, and uh, nine from um, Myanmar. So they are all safe, and uh, the ship is now being sent back to, uh, to its next port of call. The Ruin was run by a Bulgarian company. You can imagine how pleased Bulgaria is, now that both the crew and the ship are free. Bulgaria's Deputy Prime Minister thanked the Indian Navy for its heroics, and she received a warm reply from India's External Affairs Minister. This is the latest incident which proves how India is working hard to secure our seas. And our Navy is at the forefront of that endeavour. What do you do when a system does not work? A, you try to fix it, or B, you can build your own. India has chosen option B, it seems. It has long criticized Western indices and surveys on democracy, but now patience has run out. So reports say India is publishing its own, a homegrown democracy index. An Indian think tank is making it. Reports say it could be published in the next few weeks, maybe even before the general election. Now, we don't know what the methodology will be or what indicators will be used or which countries will be ranked, but we will say this. Such a move was necessary. You cannot let Western yardsticks measure the world. If you do, the problem is obvious. The West will look good, the rest will not. And this is a big problem. A lot of people factor these reports into big decisions, like investors looking at a stock market bet, or companies looking to open factories, or even tourists looking to travel. So these rankings are like report cards for countries. A good one will give you tangible benefits, a bad one will keep investors away. So it's important to look at these rankings closely, to see how fair or unfair they are. Let's look at three such recent indices. The first is the Liberal Democracy Index. It was published by Sweden's VDEM Institute. And where does India rank? At 104. Now listen to this carefully. India's rank is 104. Guess who is just above India? Niger. Let me repeat that for you. Niger ranks above India in the VDEM Index on Liberal Democracies. To put that in context, Niger is currently ruled by a military junta. Their president is under house arrest since July 2023, yet Niger ranks above India. So does Kuwait. Last month, Kuwait dissolved its parliament. Guess why? Because some lawmaker insulted the emir. It's constitutionally illegal to criticize the emir, so the entire parliament was dissolved. That country ranks above India. I guess when you have oil, democracy has a different definition. The next index is unhappiness. India ranks 126th on that list. Look at all the countries above it. Pakistan is at 108. This is a country where inflation is higher than the average age, where terrorists attack every day, where generals rig elections, and where the IMF decides the budget. I guess that's what Pakistanis are happy about, being broke and unsafe. Also above India is Myanmar, a country that has been at civil war for seven decades. Ukraine is ranked 105, Palestine ranked 103. 
Iran is ranked 100. We are honestly lost for words here. Ukraine is being invaded. Palestine does not have statehood. And Iran is ruled by a supreme leader. Yet people there are happier than Indians. Finally, we have press freedom. This one is published by the RSF, Reporters Without Borders. India is ranked 161 on this list of 180 countries. Press freedom, 161. Afghanistan is at 152. That's Taliban's Afghanistan. Let me show you what press freedom looks like there. That's press freedom for you. That's not all. Pakistan ranks above India. So do the UAE, Brunei, Somalia and Uganda. You don't have to be an expert to know that this is wrong. These rankings cannot possibly be true. But why does it keep happening? One problem is the sample size. It's often too small. Consider the World Happiness Index. They sample just 1,000 people every year. For a country like India, that's nothing. 1,000 out of 1.4 billion people. And it's not just about the size. It's also the nature of the population. You have regional differences. You have religious differences. You have socioeconomic differences. So 1,000 is too small. It will never give you the true picture. Same with press freedom. The survey takes 10 responses from each country. So if the methodology is not working, why are these surveys still being published? Because it suits the Western agenda. We looked at the top 10 countries on all three lists. Four of them are the same. They figure in all three indices. Three others feature in at least two lists. So it's basically the same countries leading all these reports, the same Western countries. So why would they stop publishing it? Which is why having a homegrown index is not a bad idea. It's not about one upping the other side. It's about offering a different system, a different perspective. Maybe for a change, we can factor in the gun deaths in America, or the hijab bans in Europe, or the brutal migration laws, or the restrictions on abortion. Then it would be a fair survey. Our next story is about the war in Ukraine. Two years and counting, how and when will this war end? Can India be the peace broker? We ask because Ukraine is having a big change of heart. It is reaching out to India. After all the criticism, all the emotional outbursts, Kiev now wants India's help. On Wednesday, President Zelensky spoke to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The Prime Minister agreed to support all peace efforts. He also promised more humanitarian aid. Zelensky, though, had a lot more to say. He invited India to the Switzerland Peace Summit. It's all the hype now. Switzerland is hosting a special summit for Ukraine. We do not have a date yet, but it could happen this summer. And who's invited? On paper, everyone is invited. Switzerland has asked all United Nations members to attend this summit. But let's face it. Not everyone will attend. So Zelensky reached out to India. He says it's important that New Delhi attends this summit. And it's clear why. India has very close relations with Russia. So Zelensky is hoping that India will use that influence, maybe nudge Russia towards a ceasefire. But here's a bigger question. Will Russia attend the talks in Switzerland? All indications are that they will not. For starters, Moscow doesn't like what's on the table. The Swiss summit is built around Zelensky's peace plan. And that involves a Russian withdrawal. It's a non-starter for Putin. Secondly, Moscow does not like the host. Their foreign minister says he does not rely on Swiss services. He says Switzerland is not neutral anymore. And that's a problem. So what's the point of having a peace summit without Russia? You can imagine how it will go. All Western allies will sit at a table, they will pat each other on the back, agree to support Ukraine, criticize Russia, and job done. But what will it change on the ground? Absolutely nothing. And Ukraine knows this. They've seen how Western support is weakening, how military aid is drying up, and at the same time, how Russia is stepping up things. Vladimir Putin has just won an election. He's starting his new term with more attacks. On Thursday, Russia fired a barrage of missiles at Kiev. It was the largest attack in weeks. Around 17 people were injured. Many buildings and industrial facilities were hit. 
Another attack was on Kharkiv. Zelensky announced that five people had been killed there. You could sense some helplessness in his tone. Necessary aid is being provided to every injured person, but this is not enough. Everyone must realize this. Kharkiv needs an adequate number of air defense systems. Sumy region needs it. Chernihiv region and all our other regions suffering from Russian terror need it. So the tide is clearly turning, which is why Zelensky is exploring alternatives. It is a big climb down, though, because not very long ago, Ukraine was quite upset with India. You may remember what their foreign minister said in 2022. In fact, let me quote what he said. When India purchases Russian crude oil at a discount, they have to understand that the discount has, has to be paid by Ukrainian blood. Every barrel of Russian crude that India gets has a good portion of Ukrainian blood in it. That was Dimitro Kuleba in 2022, Ukraine's foreign minister. And their position was not too bad then, in 2022. A successful Ukrainian counter-offensive was in the works. The sanctions on Russia were piling up, so Kiev was a bit bolder then. But now it's very different. Some $60 billion of aid is stuck in the U.S. Congress. European nations are battling a financial decline. So guess what this very same foreign minister is now doing? He's traveling to India. Again, we do not have a date yet, but reports say he'll arrive later this month. And this is big. India has not hosted top Ukrainian officials since the war began. So if Kuleba comes, it will be a first. And his agenda is quite clear. To lobby for India's support in the peace talks to see if India can play peacemaker. But will New Delhi play along? More importantly, should India wade into this war? India's position has been clear and consistent. Prime Minister Modi has said that this is not the era for war. At the same time, India has refused to gang up with the West against Russia. Before speaking to Zelensky, Modi also, Modi also spoke to Putin. He congratulated him on his re-election. He promised to strengthen relations and got an invitation to visit Russia. So Prime Minister Modi has an open invite to both Ukraine and Russia. How many leaders can say that? A handful at most. So New Delhi is well placed to mediate a settlement and it has the chops. Just a few months ago at the G20, India overcame differences over Ukraine to get a joint statement. So India can engage in quiet, constructive diplomacy. Unlike some in the West who are given to high decibel jet setting mediation efforts, India can play a role. But India must read the room first to see how sincere all sides are, especially Ukraine. They are on the back foot and in no position to dictate the outcome. Russia has spent millions of dollars and lost hundreds of soldiers in this war. They finally seem to have an upper hand, so you cannot expect Putin to just withdraw and seize fire. Zelensky will have to make concessions. If not, these trips and appeals to India are pointless. Japan is preparing for a massive change. The central bank is meeting today and tomorrow. At the end of it, a major decision is expected, one that could shake up Japan's economy. And what is that decision? Japan is ending its negative interest rates. Now bear with me for a minute. All of us know how interest rate works. Say you deposit $1,000 in your account and the bank interest is 10%. Then you get $100 as interest. That's how it normally works. But negative interest is the opposite. Let's take Japan's case. Their interest rate is minus 0.1%. So you won't be paid money for your deposits. Instead, you will have to pay the bank to keep your money there. How much? In this case, 0.1% of $1,000. That's the negative interest rate. 0.1% of $1,000 is $1. Now, I know you have questions, so let's break this down into three parts. First of all, why did Japan have this weird system? Second, what are they, why are they changing it? And three, what will it mean? Negative interest is a policy tool of central banks. They use it to fight falling prices. Now, you may be wondering, what's wrong with that? Isn't lower prices good for consumers? Well, in the short run, yes, but over long periods, no, it's not good. When prices fall, companies make less money. After all, their products are now cheaper, so they're making less money. And when companies make less money, they cut down production. Less production requires fewer jobs, so eventually you will see layoffs. 
your economy will flatline, and that's what Japan was experiencing. In the 1990s, they fell into a recession. There was a stock market and real estate crisis in Japan. Most Japanese banks reported massive losses. So afterwards, they had no money to lend. This led to a gradual fall in money supply and circulation. And the end result? Deflation, meaning prices decreased over time. Another factor is Japan's work culture. The first priority for most Japanese employees is job security. Not a massive bonus, not a double-digit hike. Most of them just want security. As a result, companies hold back on raises. Again, the end result is the same. Less spending, less inflation. To combat this, Japan entered negative interest rates in the year 2016. And the idea here was quite simple. Force banks to keep lending more. Force people to spend more. Basically, do anything but park your money in bank accounts. Some European banks have also tried this back in the 2010s. But today, there is only one negative interest regime in the world, and that is Japan. So why are they changing it now? Because Japan's wish has come true. They finally have inflation. Prices rose by almost 2% in January. It was the third straight month of inflation. One reason for that is geopolitics, the wars in Ukraine and West Asia. Both have driven up energy prices around the world. And Japan does not have its own energy. Around 90% of their oil is from West Asia. Now, as the prices rose, so did Japan's inflation. Another reason is the record wage hike. Every year, Japanese companies negotiate with workers' unions, and they decide on their salary hike. This year, it's 5.28%. That's the wage hike. It's the biggest in more than 33 years, 5.28%. All the big companies are on board this time, like Toyota Motors. They've announced their largest pay hike in 25 years. But how will this help inflation? Well, more income equals more spending. More spending equals more inflation. So Japan's central bank is now optimistic. They feel confident enough to increase the interest rate, to exit the negative interest regime. Like I said, the current rate is minus 0.1%. The plan is to increase it to 0.1%. Which brings us to the final question. What will be the impact of this move? Well, it's good news for the companies and banks. If prices rise, companies will make more money, and that money will fund corporate expansion. We're talking more jobs, more investments. It could rescue Japan from its economic rut. Until 2024, Japan was the third largest economy in the world. But in January this year, it slipped to the fourth spot. Germany took the third rank. And that too in the middle of a recession. So Tokyo needs to jumpstart its economy. Let's see if, existing, if exiting the negative interest regime helps them do that. In Argentina, it's been 100 days of Javier Millet's presidency. He's, he was elected in November last year, and he came with a promise to fix the economy with what he called a shock therapy. And he's faced a lot of backlash for it, a lot of protests. But did the shock therapy work? Looks like it did. Monthly inflation has cooled off. In December, it was 25%. In January, 20.6%. And in February, it was... 13%, so the trend looks positive. Inflation is cooling. Argentina's monthly inflation, that is. Millet calls it the result of strong fiscal discipline. The government also boasted of a budget surplus. It's the first in a decade. Even the IMF approves. That's the International Monetary Fund. So some success for President Millet there, but it's not all good. Millet has other problems like annual inflation. We just told you about monthly inflation. This is what the annual inflation looks like. It is at a record 276%, the highest in more than three decades. 57% of the country is living under poverty. There are strikes. People are protesting against the austerity measures. Argentina is going through a humanitarian crisis. I've been saying it for a long time. Once again, we see families and children rummaging through the garbage to try to put something in their bellies. We are not going to sit idle in the face of this reality. When these people explode, they explode. So we're telling the government to pay attention to what is happening and to resolve the situation of hunger that they are creating. 
When Millet took office, Argentina was already in a bad state. Inflation was at 143%. One in four Argentinians lived in poverty. The currency had lost 90% of its value against the dollar. Millet vowed to change all of that, but warned that the process would be painful. Short-term pain, long-term gain. That was Millet's motto. That's what he said. He described himself as an anarcho-capitalist. His measures were radical. First, he devalued the peso, that's Argentina's national currency. He devalued it by 50%. He slashed 50,000 public jobs. New public work contracts were suspended. Fuel and transport subsidies were all thrown out of the window. The state news agency was shut. So was the country's anti-discrimination agency. And funding for scientific research was cut down. The idea was to cut cost. And the IMF welcomed the move. So did international investors. Argentina's international bonds rallied by 7%. That's a reflection of investor confidence. So it started off on a positive note. Millet achieved some early success, but he also faced political hurdles. You see, his party is in the minority. It doesn't have the numbers in Congress. And his rivals do not like his plans. Last week, the Senate rejected a proposal, a decree to change 300 existing standards, like rent caps, regulations on health care, labor laws, privatizing state-owned enterprises, reducing maternity leave pay. So this was a radical austerity plan, and it met with opposition. People took to the streets in protest. The courts called it unconstitutional. Lawmakers did not support it, and Argentina's Senate then struck it down. It's a setback for the president. And he's said to be working on another strategy, firming up his numbers, waiting for the midterm elections. They'll be held next year, in 2025. If he does, if his party does well in those elections, he may get the bill through. And while his policies are delivering for now, they do have their own set of problems. Like I said, more than half of Argentina's population is, is living in, in poverty. Food prices are soaring. People cannot afford food. So when the government cuts food aid, these people suffer. Some of them are scavenging to survive. When we take the rubbish bins out, there are at least 20 people who approach us. They are looking for something to take home. This is a very tough and a sad situation. Critics believe Millet's policies could lead to mass unemployment, something that would wreck the economy. But Millet is convinced about his plan. He says it will get way worse before it gets better. Either way, Argentina is looking at a turbulent future. Our next story comes from Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, home to about 1.4 million people and an array of tourist attractions. But some would say Abu Dhabi's most interesting attraction is its money, a sovereign wealth fund worth $1.5 trillion, one of the biggest in the world. And the city is milking it to lure hedge fund titans from across the world. It is offering hedge fund managers a range of unusual perks, from country club memberships to elite school admissions for their children. Is this Abu Dhabi's bid to become a financial hub and will it work? Here's a report. The richest emirate in the Gulf is counting on getting richer. We're talking about Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates. It's rolling out the red carpet for hedge fund titans. Officials are formalizing a program for hedge fund managers. Think of it as a package of perks tailored to lure in the big money makers. And the incentives range widely from lifestyle support and visas to admissions in elite schools and even memberships at country clubs. So anything goes, as long as the finance professionals move to Abu Dhabi. And chances are, that's exactly what would happen. The perks will ensure a smooth onboarding. But more than that, Abu Dhabi itself is a big draw. Rather, the city's sovereign wealth capital is. It's valued at $1.5 trillion. It's one of the biggest sovereign capital funds in the world, enough to catch the attention of any big hedge fund manager. On top of this, Abu Dhabi saw a quick post-COVID economic rebound. It offers a relative ease of doing business, a neutral political stance, a relatively low rate of crime, and a time zone that allows workers to trade across European, American and Asian hours. On top of this, Abu Dhabi is part of a country that loves the rich. In today's climate, few countries welcome the wealthy. In most nations, billionaires often come under scrutiny. But the UAE does not vilify capitalism. 
That, combined with other factors, makes its capital a giant appeal for the rich. And the city hopes it remains that way. Actually, Abu Dhabi is betting on it. But why? Why is the city offering unlikely perks to finance professionals? In simple terms, to get even richer. Abu Dhabi has set its sights on an ambitious goal. It hopes to become one of the world's biggest financial centres and draw professionals from the likes of New York, London, Hong Kong and Singapore. The question is, will the plan work? If we are to believe the signs, it could. Let's take a look at the Abu Dhabi Global Market or ADGM. This is Abu Dhabi's financial centre. As of last year, it had 1,825 operational entities. That's a 32% growth from 2022. It had 102 asset managers as well, managing 141 funds. Today, ADGM is the fastest growing financial centre in the region. Plus, top global financial firms are opening offices in Abu Dhabi, the likes of Goldman Sachs, Rothschild & Co and Morgan Stanley. So things are going well for the city. But there is one hurdle – competition. Abu Dhabi is competing with two financial hubs in the neighbourhood – Dubai, which is a short car ride away, and Riyadh, which can be easily accessed via short flights. And these two competitors have been in the game for longer. For instance, these three big names may have set up base in Abu Dhabi, but they've been in Dubai for years, where their finance professionals are most likely paying their own club fees from the big money that they've been generating for years. So before Abu Dhabi tries to overtake financial mammoths like New York and London, its first big challenge lies in its own neighbourhood. Only time will tell if this city of islands can be a financial island unto itself. Our next story is from West Africa. It's about America's failed policy in Niger. Niger is a country of about 25 million people. It is located in West Africa in the so-called coup belt. Niger experienced a coup last July. The military ousted and imprisoned President Mohamed Bazoum. A junta has ruled the country since. They say they took over for two reasons. One, to better fight a terrorist insurgency in the region. And two, to remove French troops from their country. You see, France was Niger's former colonial overlord. It was very unpopular in the country, so when the junta took, took power, the French were forced to leave. But France was not the only foreign power in the country. There was also an EU and American force based in Niger. They were there to fight terrorists as well. When the junta took over, the Europeans packed up, but the Americans stayed. They moved out of Niger's capital, Niamey. But about 1,000 American troops are stationed at a base near the city of Agadez. It's called Air Base 201. The base houses a fleet of MQ-9 Reaper drones. It was built about six years ago at a cost of about $110 million. This base was used for anti-terror operations, which have stopped since the coup in July. But the American troops have stuck around, sometimes engaging in self-defense operations. But mostly, they've been on standby. But now it seems that the American soldiers will have to pack up. The government of Niger, taking into account the aspirations and interests of its people, resolves in all responsibility to denounce with immediate effect the agreement relating to the status of United States military personnel and civilian employees of the U.S. Department of Defense on the territory of the Republic of Niger. Yes, Niger's junta wants the Americans out. It seems that Washington's plans in the region are in a shambles, and it's completely their fault, maybe, maybe add. It could have still worked out for the U.S. had they refrained from their old habits, condescension and threats. The government of Niger therefore strongly denounces the condescending attitude combined with the threat of reprisals by the head of the American delegation against the government and the people of Niger. Last week, an American delegation went to Niger. It included Assistant Secretary of State Molly Fee, Assistant Secretary of Defense Celeste Wallander, and the U.S. Africa Command's General Michael Langley. This high-level delegation sat down with the Niger junta and proceeded to chastise them. It's no secret that Niger has swapped France for Russia. Russia's Wagner mercenary group joined Niger's fight against terror. This was just weeks after the French were asked to leave. Last December, Niger's Junta appointed prime minister was also in Moscow. They were talking about expanding ties, which is natural given the situation. 
But it's not just the Russian ties that have irked the U.S. Niger's prime minister has visited Iran as well. He was there in January. And that was perhaps the last straw for the Americans. The U.S. delegation confronted Niger last week. They accused the junta of trying to sell uranium to Tehran. You heard that right. The U.S. says they're planning to help Iran develop nuclear weapons. Niger junta has slammed this accusation. The government of Niger rejects the misleading allegations made by the head of the American delegation, who maintains that it had signed a secret uranium agreement with the Islamic Republic of Iran. This cynical approach, usually used to discredit, demonize and justify their threats against states, is reminiscent of the Second Iraq War. And that seems to have been the final straw. That's when Niger said that they want the U.S. military out. It's not final yet. The U.S. is now scrambling to undo the damage and to keep a hold of its $100 million base. But it shows just how tactless the Americans can be. They could have just laid low and gone about their business. But no, they thought it was smart to bully a smaller country. And this time, it has backfired spectacularly. What do most countries have in common? According to the World Health Organization, unsafe air. The WHO recently conducted a study. It analyzed air pollution across 134 nations and regions, and it came to a disturbing and shameful conclusion. Only seven countries on Earth breathe clean air. Australia, Estonia, Finland, Grenada, Iceland, Mauritius, and New Zealand. Only seven. All other nations breathe toxic air, some more than others, like Asian and African nations, with Bangladesh, Pakistan and India leading the pack. So what's behind this? And what does this mean for our world? Our next report tells you. Human beings have certain basic needs. They need four major things to survive. Food, water, shelter and air. If even one of these things is threatened, it becomes difficult to lead a healthy life. And that's exactly what is happening. Our fourth need, the air we breathe, is under threat. Air pollution is the world's leading environmental cause of death. It kills about 7 million people every year the world over. This is more than the deaths from AIDS and malaria combined. Because across the world, most countries breathe unsafe air. There are only seven outliers. Australia, Estonia, Finland, Grenada, Iceland, Mauritius and New Zealand. These are the few oases of safe air. As disturbing as this is, we aren't making this up. The World Health Organization says so. It studied air pollution levels across 134 nations and regions and found that all but seven nations have toxic air. But they don't suffer equally. The worst air quality is mostly in Asia and Africa, ironically, where the vast majority of human population lives. And who leads the pack? These are the five most polluted countries in the world. Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Tajikistan and Burkina Faso. In Bangladesh, the pollution is 15 times higher than the WHO guideline. In Pakistan, it is more than 14 times higher. And in India, more than 10 times higher. But remember, this is an average. The deeper you dig, the worse it gets. So the World Health Organization did not just study nations, it also focused on cities. 7,800 cities were analyzed globally. A list of 100 cities with the worst air pollution was prepared. Of all these names, 99 cities with the worst air pollution on Earth are in one continent, Asia. And 83 of them are in one country, India. Which is the most polluted city in the world? Begusarai in the state of Bihar. It is home to half a million people. And air pollution that is 23 times the WHO guideline. Followed by Gohati in Assam. And the capital city of New Delhi. Now, India is not the only country in a smoggy spot. So is its neighbour, China. In 2014, Beijing announced a war against pollution. It made substantial progress. But after years of improvement, China saw a 6.3% increase in pollution levels in 2023. Why? Because China saw an uptick in economic reopening last year post-COVID. At least that's the reason China cited. What about other countries? What's behind their soaring air pollution levels? 
In Asia and Africa, vehicle traffic, crop and wood burning are some of the big reasons. In North America, it's wildfires. But there's one major reason which can be blamed the world over. Fossil fuel emissions. This is the biggest contributor to air pollution. It causes one in five deaths worldwide. Yet, despite all the research and roundtables, a solution to air pollution has not found its seat at the table. So, billions of people have no choice but to breathe toxic air daily. They say comparison is the thief of joy. Ironically, when it comes to tracking our own joy, we love to compare. And it's not limited to humans, it applies to companies, even countries. Maybe especially countries. Because to them, happiness is an operational objective. Nations want to know where they stand and every year they get a reality check. Thanks to the World Happiness Index. It's an annual and global barometer. It is a subjective ranking of happiness. It, it studies 143 countries where participants are asked to score their lives. Six variables are taken into account. GDP per capita, life expectancy, social support, freedom, generosity and corruption. And these surveys are compiled. They frame a picture of the nation as a whole and the nations are ranked on the basis of well-being. Today is the International Day of Happiness and the latest World Happiness Report has been released. We dissected it for you. Which countries came on top? What were the obvious findings? What was hidden? And what were the big shockers or surprises? We'll discuss that, starting with the ab absolute non-shocker. Let me ask you this. Which country do you think came on top? No points for guessing. It was Finland again. For the seventh consecutive year, this Nordic nation is, has been ranked the happiest in the world. What explains this big win? Experts point to the Finnish infrastructure of happiness. A safe and secure environment, affordable opportunities, relative equality, high levels of trust and most of all, a policy push. In Finland, happiness is at the front and center of governance and it seems like the land of unicorns and rainbows. But which other nations came close? Finland was followed by Denmark, Iceland, Sweden and Israel. That's right, Israel ranks fifth. Given the war with Hamas, this does come as a surprise. Israel has been in the top 10 since 2022. But what explains this jump to top five? The rankings are based on a three-year average, basically 2021 to 2023. So big events throughout the years are taken into account, but their impact is muted. So life evaluation in Israel fell, fell sharply, but it only accounted for a third of the average. The timing matters as well. The happiness survey in Israel was conducted after October 7th, after the war broke out. But it was much before the warfare soared. Hence, the result was not as bad as one would expect. And this applies to the ranking of Palestine as well. Its statehood is not widely recognized. But as per this index, Palestine stands at number 103, 103, which is not a great position to be in, but much better than one would expect because the survey here was conducted much before October 7th in Palestine, before life evaluations would have plummeted. So there are some holes in this report. One can point to India's ranking and say the same. According to the World Happiness Index, India ranks at the 126th position, the same as last year, 126 out of 143 countries. India comes after nations like Niger, Burkina Faso, Iran and Ecuador, nations with a tense political climate and an array of problems. What explains this? According to the report, India's caste system plays a role. So do religious discrimination and unjust developmental schemes. Sure, there is room for improvement here. But putting India behind nations rocked by coups and violence seems like a stretch. And the surprises do not cease here. Older Indians have higher life satisfaction than the young. And this trend is picking up the world over. According to this report, something is going wrong with the young, specifically the Gen Z, between the ages of 15 and 24. They're not happy. Especially in the UK, across Europe, the US and Australia, experts claim Gen Z is suffering an equivalent of a midlife crisis. They point to a lack of jobs, lack of affordable housing, fear about war and climate change, and most of all, social media. Social media is being blamed for robbing the young of their well-being. 
for worsening their psychological state and lowering their self-esteem. So everyone may not agree with the happiness rankings, but if there's one thing we can agree to, it is this. If the young are not as happy as they can be, it should upset us enough to do something about it.